Angel is brought to you by NetSuite from Oracle. The only system you need to run your business. Go to netsuite.com slash angel to get your free guide called Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Angel, the podcast. This is the podcast companion to angelthebook.com. Yes, I wrote a book called Angel about my adventures, angel investing in 150 companies, six of which became unicorns famously. And in the book, I talk about strategies where you as a founder can raise money from angels and as maybe a high net worth individual or perhaps a non-accredited investor now that that's opening up to more individuals. You could even invest as little as 100 or 500 or $1,000 in a startup. And Perhaps, who knows, maybe hit lightning in a bottle, maybe have a 10x, 50x, or 100x return on your investment. I know this sounds crazy, but this is how angel investing works. This is how early stage investing works. You've probably wondered about it. Who are these people? How do they get access to these deals? What do the contracts look like? How much is the value of the company? Well, that's what we talk about on this podcast and in the book. So read the book, angelthebook.com. Perhaps if you like the sound of my voice, congratulations, you're one of like three people who like it, myself, my mom, and you. And you can then listen to me read the book on Audible, which we love Audible. And uh, you can listen to this podcast. Season one just ended. And we're now in season two of Angel. We're going to do 10 great episodes with a dozen or so amazing angel investors and early stage investors. Many people ask me, what are the differences between these rounds of funding, Jason? I hear sweat equity. I hear bootstrapping, I hear friends and family, angel round, seed round, and eventually I hear Series A. When you hear Series A, that means you're typically having an institutional investor, a professional grade venture capital firm that invests millions of dollars and takes a board seat. That's venture capital. Right before venture capital is a range of funding options. Bootstrapping means you don't raise money from anywhere. You just basically use your customers as the ones who pay you in advance sometimes for your product, like Kickstarter, that's bootstrapping, or Indiegogo if you see somebody raise the money there. Sweat equity, that means you and your found co-founders just put your own sweat and your effort into building the product, you don't take any money from anybody. Friends and family, self-explanatory, it's your friends and family, you're bold enough to take their money. But after those three, and before the venture capitals phase, we see early stage investing defined as angels, or seed stage funds. Today on the program, we have the urban.us fund. Urban, you don't say urban us, do you? Yeah. You do say urban us. Yeah. Okay. And, we try uh, to change everyone on that domain name. Yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> with me today, I have two guests, uh, Sean Abrahamson, who's the managing partner, and Stonely Baptiste, who is the partner at urban.us ventures. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks. I know, Stoney, you and I have gotten to know each other pretty well. You come to all of our incubator classes, give great feedback, and you're a true champion to uh, the startups, so thank you for that. Sean, you and I are uh, just getting acquainted now. Tell me, what is Urban Us, and why did you start it? So we invest in any startup that we think is going to make city life better. And so at the moment, that covers things like transportation, housing, um, some very boring stuff like waste and water, um, energy, and then uh, the last category is government. So mm. we try and help, to, uh, well, try and focus on startups that help governments deliver services. Got it. Why are cities important to you, Sean? Why, how did you come up with this concept? Why cities? Why a city-led fund or city-focused fund? So probably about five years ago, um, Mayor Bloomberg was heading up this group called C40 Cities. It was like the 40 largest cities in the world. And they were trying to figure out what they could do to contribute to reducing climate risk. Hmm. So either resilience or reducing emissions. Got it. And one of the sort of really outstanding stats was that cities are about 70% of emissions. And so if you sort of follow cities' huh. growth against emissions, you're like, well, so cities are climate change. Huh. Um, so that was the that was the starting point, and then I think um, as we started to work together, and we started to look at okay, if you get beyond emissions, 
assuming you're going to solve for emissions, you actually want lots of people to live in cities because it's a very efficient lifestyle. Yeah, that was what I was just wondering when <clears> you're saying that because I thought cities were would be on a per capita basis less carbon. So they might be the majority of the carbon, but on a per capita basis, isn't the majority too? They, they, well, they're better. So if you look at someone who lives in like the middle of Manhattan yeah. and you sort of all in, what's your footprint? Yeah. You're doing a lot better than the person who's commuting in an hour. Right, because so, the commute is burning a lot of fuel. Right. So living local saves a lot of time. Right. But this is not a nonprofit. This is a, a seed stage fund. The goal here is to make a profit. Right. So you, in some way, see the city as a way to make investments that will turn a huge profit, correct? Right. I mean, so we sort of come at everything from a, how big is the problem that you're solving? Mm. And the interesting thing about cities is if you find something that could be a few million dollars addressable market in one city, there's probably another hundred cities. So the addressable ah. market's always, you don't have to ask the addressable market question. They're yeah. always big. If you make it work in this city, right. there are a hundred or a thousand more like it. Right. Which is the story of Uber Absolutely. or Yelp. They both figured out some playbook that they were able to perfect in San Francisco and bring to other cities. So only what appeals to you about this city led mission? Why did you join the firm? Yeah. Well, I met Sean around the time that I was working with a team to build a platform to solve a very hairy city problem. Um, What's which, that problem? In Miami. Um, I, 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 well, I moved no, out. No, we say big, hairy problem for <laughs> no, people who don't yeah, understand. No. We say in our industry there is a term, your big, hairy, audacious problem, right? Is that what it is, yeah. big, hairy problem? It's like this big, ugly problem that you got you got to solve. So right. go ahead. Yeah, what I, was I, the problem in Miami? Well, I, I had moved down to Miami uh, after selling my software company that I built in Fort Lauderdale. And F Fort Lauderdale and Miami share one thing in common. They're both river cities. Mm. They're next to the water. They have waterways going through them. Um, you move around more in Miami because it's a little bit more expansive. But once you get to downtown and you're trying to get somewhere on time, you almost always run into a bridge that goes over a river and somebody is going through that river in their boat when you're trying to get to your meeting. That is a big, hairy problem. Yeah. And, I mean, <laughs> the, there never was one. The interesting thing is that um, this really started uh, it, or was galvanized at a hackathon where the Downtown Development Authority put out a challenge. Somebody help us figure this out. Um, and you know, our team came together. We built an IoT device to monitor bridges. And we looked at the data, you know, there are a few hundred thousand movable in pieces of movable infrastructure, bridges specifically in the US throughout all the cities. Wow. There are all the railroads um, and, and railway crossings. Uh, so there's a bunch of movable infrastructure that there's just no eyeballs on it, no awareness of what the status is. Um, and that's where we started. And, and if, you know, it goes without saying, that's a really hard problem to solve. Oh yeah. You're running into regulations. We've tried selling to the city. So you're running into you know, procurement, there's permitting. You're also dealing with um, you know, permitting and regulations at the federal level, because you're talking about public infrastructure that has security, national security implications. So in any case, uh, Sean and I met at a, just a great time where, you know, as an entrepreneur, I was thinking about these challenges. Um, Sean had been angel investing and started, you know, doing the research and homework around specifically focusing on the city problems. Um, and in general, it just seemed like, yes, the bridge thing was interesting, but there was this much bigger, more interesting problem of, you know, all of the challenges of cities that could be solved with entrepreneurship. Yeah. You know, who else might be out there trying to solve these problems, running into the same walls that I'm running into. Um, so before going completely bust on this startup, I decided to take the resources pool together with Sean and start finding some of these founders and supporting mm -hmm. them. Um, writing checks, of course, because uh, we automatically knew that that would be one of their pain points, but building out a network around them to support um, you know, co-investors, other founders who could give advice, city officials who were more friendly. It just, it seemed like um, after more than a decade of building various types of companies, um, I, you know, didn't plan to become an investor per se, but I had developed a passion and a compassion for uh, entrepreneurs. And uh, this, this felt like the right way to give back, but also I, I don't think I could find a more exciting and uh, interesting problem set. Um, the the yeah. intersection of cities and climate are probably one of the most critical things we could figure out uh, at this um, pivot in our in, in history. Yeah, I mean, people are moving to cities, yeah. which we were told was going to be an opposite trend. Be the internet was supposed to 
make living anywhere possible and we would flee cities and we'd all live in the country and be in some VR headset or on some broadband connection with our Cisco spark boards and we would we'd all stay home all day in our you know bathrobes this hasn't happened Sean, why did this, why did people flee to cities as opposed to away from them what's the trend there do you, oh, do you have any insight into why what we were told that broadband would make everybody go outside of cities, but the opposite side was just young people like to live in cities or they're cheaper and more efficient because it seems like they're expensive and painful. Yeah, I mean, I, my sense is, I mean, so, so Sonia and I now routinely debate this, you know, as he's trying to figure out, okay, can you, can you, do you need to live in San Francisco or can you live an hour away? Yeah. Right. And so it's really interesting to articulate, like, what are the benefits of being nearby? And a lot of it is, Oh, you know, I have a, you know, Jason had something and now we back on and we can chat with him. Yeah. Like if we were living two hours away, it's like you lose. No collision. Right. There's no collision. Yeah. And so I think social, to some extent, increased the number of potential collisions. Mm. And if, but you can't realize the optionality if you're too far away. Right. So, so we can get like, to know each other on LinkedIn. We can fist bump each other with stars and hearts on Twitter as much as we want. But at a certain point, being able to sit down and have a cup of coffee or meet with a founder is what needs to happen. There does seem to be some trend of the areas around cities becoming more viable. Maybe you could speak to, to that a little bit, Stoney. The, the Oaklands or the Brooklands of the world are now seemingly becoming cooler and hipper and more desirable for young people. Uh, maybe you can talk about gentrification versus the re- sort of rebooting of certain areas. Because it does seem when I go to New York now, and I grew up in Brooklyn when it wasn't cool, and I you know strive to get to Manhattan. Then I got to Manhattan, and now here we are, thirty years later, and nobody wants to be in Manhattan. They want to be in Brooklyn. Brooklyn's cool. What's the what's the impetus for this, and what's the opportunity? Well, I mean, there's two things um, there. One is the development of what, what what we're calling or what's being called mega regions as huh. as a, a uh, mega region mega region as a core city um, bursts out at the ste- at the seams uh, you know it just you just can't fit any more people into that mega region and so folks start commuting but not from too far away mm. and ultimately you end up with clusters of those folks and those regions themselves become yeah um, uh, those cities themselves become part of this broader larger and growing mega region so San Francisco isn't an independent city on an island it's now Oakland and the peninsula all play with each other and people are moving between those regions and so you really can't talk about San Francisco has an independent no, city anymore. It's the anymore. Bay Area. It's now. the Bay Area. You have Fremont becoming a destination after Tesla right. was there, and now I guess Zuckerberg's going to put a Facebook office in Fremont. Right. And so the second the second um, trend is the what what's being called the urbanization of the suburbs, uh, where you're going a little bit further out, but you're you're finding people who are often still commuting into the city hmm. and becoming very spoiled by the benefits you get out of the city, which are you know very walkable, um, the connectivity that we talk about. And so there are, there's a push and efforts to um, create those same amenities hmm. in the suburbs. So, so bringing more of those local um, destinations and the walkability to the suburbs. Um, and That's yeah. fascinating. So if you have a suburb and you can make it feel more like a city, then maybe people go to the city twice a week, Yeah, but they have a little mini city there. Exactly. And right. it's very interesting. I remember in uh, New York, when New York was kind of busting at the seams, Philadelphia of all places yep. became a, a commuting city. People would take Penn Station to Penn Station, live in Philly, come to New York two or three nights a week, crash yeah, on somebody's couches. Like, what is it, like 50 minutes? It's not yeah, terrible. no, it's, it's, I mean, it's a little expense because of the, right. the Amtrak costs a little bit of money, but it did become a sort of uh, uh, a mega city, uh, is you call it a mega city? A mega region. Mega region, right? Not a city, a region, it's yeah. the, the entire region. Let's go through what you're looking for in terms of the stage, and uh, we get an idea of the topic of the city. So maybe you just take us through the stage you like to engage with founders. Is there a specific stage, pre-product launch, pre-series A, post-series A? Where do, you, where do you like to operate? So I think we started off at at Seed before Seed had sort of before and after and yeah. sort of variations. Um, I think we've landed up, so we partnered with BMW in an accelerator program. Oh, wow. Which is sort of, I would say, pre-customer. 
Mm. But then there's a continuum in there of, you know, prototype. Um, you know, there's a few companies with with customers. So sort of think of that as maybe five million or lower in valuation, mm -hmm. roughly. And then there's sort of classic seed, which is you know you're starting to get a little bit of traction. Um, and really trying to figure out, okay, well, how do I go from these first few people who seem to like me, maybe have given me some money, to the next 20 or 30, so in B2B or ramp up users if it's... Some type of scaling right, of the some product. Some going from like that, your friends using it right. to <laughs> right. so it's people you, you don't you basically know. Are not, you like out of product development and into building an actual business. Right. That, that, and then, so you'll operate in both those places, right. pre-launch, post-launch. And, yeah. and we've done some post-seed where, I, I mean, I think you've talked about this, there's sort of this... You, you need to hit some very specific metrics to get to Series A. Right. And you may be a little bit short of that, so you want to buy some more time so you can boost your valuation. Yeah. So we, we've done a few of those. Which people would call, Stonely, I guess, seed extension yeah. or pre-Series A round. We, we did some seed we funding. We just call them kind of expensive. Yeah. It's ex yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Relative. <laughs> well, they could be expensive. Or, and, you know, one of the trends I've seen is people, uh, you know, a, a startup I've invested in gets a year out. They're still a year from being at a Series A, and they raise a year after I invested at the same valuation. So I could have waited a year, taken out all that risk, and that's created, in my mind, I don't know if you've seen the same trends, Stonely, there seems to be no rush in some people's mind mm. to get in. So the sense of urgency to get in a deal mm. feels qualitatively different to me than it did two years ago. I don't know if you've seen the same thing. Absolutely, yeah, I mean, the, I think, the the data is being sh been shared recently that in general there's a there's a slowdown mm -hmm. um, in in the funding funding cycles it's it's tougher now to raise money than it was two years ago yeah uh, when for when seed was, stage yeah yeah for seed stage when it was a feeding frenzy mm -hmm. um, and and frankly yeah the the teams are realizing that you know you have to actually have proof points to graduate um, and what do you and, think and those are. are when you think about graduating to Series A, when you see a company get a Series A done efficiently, what qualities do they have? Well, I mean, it really depends on the industry sure. that, that they're in and what, what they're building. Um, I think as a baseline, um, we, we talk a lot about momentum, mm. which is depending on what you're building, what are the important metrics that reflect that you've figured something out and the only barrier to you conquering the world is money. Ah. And, um, you know, that might, you know, more often than not just be growth in customers. Uh, but sometimes it's growth in users. Mm -hmm. and, um, and sometimes uh, it's the size of the contracts. We, we end up investing in a few business to government startups. And that often becomes the, the big mm. switch uh, so they go from the having whatever five figure contracts to six and seven figure. Exactly. And that's when, hey, if they're if somebody's willing to spend over six figures on this software solution, SaaS, whatever yep. it is, that's a pretty good sign that they're getting ready for a Series A. If it's only going to be thousands to low tens of thousands of dollars a year or lifetime value, why should VCs get involved in general? Yeah, yeah. And, I th and I think there's an element of your know, repeatability, right? So you, you, someone could say to you, assuming mm -hmm. I gave you ten million dollars. Do I believe that the value of the enterprise, you know, 18 months out could be double or more? Mm. And so you need to be able to articulate that, you know, here's my pipeline and I kind of know where I'm going to go and get the sort of 2x in, in growth. Um, not, so the, the people who are hitting momentum that don't actually know how to deploy more capital mm. well, aren't sure. So anyway. But. How how hard is it to sell into government, Stonely? Like when you you talked about your IoT company and how hard that was and arduous. What's your advice to people trying to sell into governments? Should they or should they not? Should they try to go consumer and then after they establish a consumer base, then go to governments? Or is that diluting, trying to serve two different masters? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it really is um, – Bi binary. I, huh. I, I I wouldn't advise. It really comes back down to sort of decisions that the team makes as to what sort of company they want to build. Mm. Um, but what sort of life they want to have? Right. right? What like, sort of life they want to have? What sort of network they have access to? Mm. It's um, a very personal decision. Right. It, the, it's that. But also, depending on what you're building, we have teams where we meet really early, where they're at that 
point of making the decision. And, and we have teams where we've advised them double down and focus on government. And we've had other teams where we've helped them sort of rethink the value chain and the stakeholders at play in mm -hmm. the problem they're trying to solve and say, well, actually the more interesting customer here are the businesses, uh, the developers or the insurance industry. Right. And so we've helped redirect teams away from government. And then there are other teams where it's like, well, if the government could be your customer and a very valuable partner for you, and you have the network that can help you really maximize that value. So it really does come down uh, to the unique problem set and team that, that's being built. There is costs and benefits to building any sort of company. Government has a um, maybe necessary bias of being harder, but it's harder real, to sell into. Harder to sell into. Slow. Slow, but it's really not that much different than large enterprise. Huh. And and large enterprise sales don't get as much negative bias against them. Interesting. So people are overly biased against governments when a six to twelve month or six to eighteen month cycle is what you might see in a big company as well. Right. If you're selling Slack or whatever it happens to be, Lead IQ or outreach, whatever product you're using. I mean, that still takes a year to get into some big customers. Right. Is that what a government takes? A year or two? Are they on some sort of cycle? It depends. The other aspect of the challenge around selling government is there are multiple ways to sell into government. Ah. Depending on how your product is priced, you may be selling, um, you may be able to get a contract done in days or a few months. If you're a six-figure uh, product, then yeah, you may be looking at a year plus. Now you're triggering all kinds of review because you're exactly. dealing with taxpayer money. Exactly. It makes it much more difficult. But then I would think that they're willing to pay high prices and go long with the solution. They probably stick with the product for five or 10 years. Right. I mean, a lot of stickiness, um, a lot of, a lot of um, value, relationship value. Mm -hmm. When one city or government has made an investment in you, um, you now have a, um, a bit of uh, that goodwill in reaching and connecting with other uh, potential customers at, at that size. All right. When we get back from this quick break, we're going to go and do a little quick portfolio review. Okay. And we're going to talk about how you're addressing some of the big issues that cities face. Homelessness, housing, water, um, and uh, construction, and all this madness that's going on inside cities, which are hard to live in sometimes. Uh, okay. Let me take a moment to thank NetSuite by Oracle. Thank you, NetSuite from Oracle, for supporting season two of Angel, the podcast, and the results are in. Survey Inc.'s 5,000 companies show that the top barriers to growth are that it takes finance too long to close the books and that companies are too slow to launch new products, hiring and keeping good people, managing cash, and too many disconnected systems. It's very hard when your business grows to get a full picture of that business. And if, you, if this sounds familiar to you, it's probably because you've outgrown your business and financial management system. QuickBooks and spreadsheets are fine in the early days of a business. We've all been there. But it's probably now taking you two or three or 10 times uh, as long to get simple things done and to get accurate answers about your business. And that's why you should know about NetSuite from Oracle. NetSuite is one, is the one system that tracks and manages revenue, cash flow, HR, inventory, projects, even e-commerce for every industry. And that's what's important here. NetSuite is working across all industries and it is a phenomenal product. Now you can run your business from a dashboard on your phone and you do not have to wait to get these important answers that founders and boards and investors need to know. And that's why thousands of companies use NetSuite. It's the only system you need to run your business. So here's your call to action. I want you to go to netsuite.com slash angel, netsuite dot com slash angel and you will get your free guide called crushing the five barriers to growth that's right go to netsuite.com slash angel and get crushing the five barriers to growth that's netsuite.com slash angel netsuite.com slash angel thanks again to netsuite and you can go ahead and thank netsuite as well uh, on your twitter handle or facebook for supporting independent media like angel we couldn't do it without you okay let's get back to the, this episode, and uh, my guests, again, are Stonely Baptiste, who is a partner at Urban.us, and Sean Abrahamson, who is the managing partner over at Urban.us. You can visit them, urban.us. Us, get it, got it. And they're Urban Us Co. on Twitter. So when I uh, left you, I was teasing a bit about your portfolio. We invest in companies together as well. 
Let's talk a little bit about um, housing, homelessness, affordable housing. Uh, you're working on some projects there, Sean Stoney. Maybe either of you can take that on. Uh, sure. So um, you know, I think we think about affordable housing in a sort of larger context of affordable living, right? Mm. So, that, so I think most people's reflex is if I make your cost of living lower through rent, I've solved the problem. But very often what happens is people find themselves living far away and now mm. I have to own a car, which I didn't have to own. So my all-in cost of living actually is probably the same. Ah. So there's some interesting uh, things that you start to think about. So we invested in a company called Star City. What is Star City? So yeah. Star City does um, co-living. Mm. So the, your sort of private space is smaller. Mm. So the size of like a small hotel room. And then you get more shared amenities to try and balance that out. But the oh. end result is that your rent can be significantly lower. It's like a WeWork co-living kind of space, right? WeWork is going to launch co-living, I think, or they may right. have. We live. We live. We live. Right. That's so a the- terrible name. <laughs> we live. I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, to, I mean, WeWork makes total sense. Hey, we all work, but we live is kind of a little bit like, a little bit too much gravitas. Like, uh, but they, do you think this is the future for young people? Live in the city, have smaller space, pay less, and have less anxiety, stress, and agita? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's just you, you're going to trade it off, right? You, you can either have a longer commute mm-hmm. and your sort of stack of monthly costs is going to include more transport costs. And you're going to suffer from more de- <clears throat> depression, drug abuse, domestic violence, and divorce, which is correlated with the length of commute. Isn't that amazing that all of those things are correlated with length of commute? I've been read a study. All of these things, like horrible things in people's lives, are correlated to the length of commute. Mm. And now, cause and causation, of course, is something to be careful with, but right. it's pretty clear that an hour and a half commute each way is soul crushing. Yep. Anything past a half an hour becomes soul crushing, from what I understand. 45 minutes is kind of the limit before you start resenting it. Yeah, so, I mean, so figuring out how to redo the economics mm. around, let's, let's start with rent, because a lot of the people that we're talking about are not yet at the point where they're even considering buying. Yeah. Um, so we think that's interesting. Star City. Star City. Interesting. Um, do they buy a home and then, or do they create like an Airbnb of rooms or are they building so like they, they, they single are, room occupancies or dorm rooms? How are they doing it? So they, they're finding existing spaces in the city that mm. may not have ever been conceived of for residential. Ah. And then they are, you know, essentially redoing the interior hmm. um, to their spec. And... Yeah. And adults live in this too. Like, and it's not just for twenty somethings. I mean, it could be a thirty something or forty something and live yep. in this. All ages. What's that? All ages. Yeah. All ages. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you want to I mean it's, a, it, it's a, it, it really does come down to choice. I, 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 we're not prescribing that this is how everyone's going to live. No, it's right? a way to live. It's a way to live, and this is one approach to what is a very dynamic, big, hairy problem again. Yeah, housing. And, and we've taken a few different approaches, um, one of which is blockable. Which, which we're, we, both we're both in. investors in. Yeah. Which is targeting the challenge from a different angle. Um, you know, the, the rental market, that's a multi-trillion dollar market. We'll do great with Star City, I think. We'll also do great with Blockable because they're targeting the cost of construction. Mm. Um, we really liked Aaron, uh, and over the time we got to know them, thanks to the, thanks to the introduction from you. Mm. Um, and and we really were excited by the fact that they were deliberately focused on affordable housing. And so they can serve a particular type of customer that is targetedly trying to solve the cost of construction for affordable housing. Explain what they do in a a nutshell. Well, they're they're turning um, uh, housing construction from a uh, a on-site construction um, challenge to a manufactured um, manufacturing challenge, right. um, and you know the particularities of, of, of their approach are around how their folk, what level of customer they're focusing on, uh, the processes they're creating, um, and yeah, and the type of coalition that they're building, both in their uh, on their cap table, but also their first few their first few customers. Yeah, um, it's pretty amazing. They're yeah. literally building what you might consider like an Airstream or a shipping container, but both of those have massive limitations. You're either living in a trailer park, which doesn't feel great, no offense to people who are living in them, but I mean, my friend Tony Shea lives in a trailer, he lives in an Airstream, but I don't mean to be judgmental, but it's not, doesn't feel like a permanent home because it's got wheels. Right. And then you have sort of the shipping containers that some people have kind of rigged and 
you're living in a metal container that yeah, feels they have inhumane. a lot of limitations and they're and they're rust and they're heavy they're building actual blockable houses that yeah. are almost like legos that can stack two three stories yeah multi-family units yeah yeah they can be put up quickly exactly and cheaper yep yeah, it's, I'm so excited about Blockable and what the potential is because there's so much nimbyism at one point, not in my backyard. Uh, and we see that here in San Francisco a lot. People who got here in the 60s or 70s or 80s and got their house saying, do not build anything else. Mm. I, like literally there was a big story in the New York Times this past weekend about Berkeley where somebody wanted to put three units on a large lot, like micro homes or whatever you want to call them, uh, thousand square foot homes. And the neighbors in Berkeley, which is supposed to be like a progressive place, the most progressive place in the world, were stopping them from adding additional housing because they're NIMBY, not in my backyard. Yep. Um, but then on top of that, you have uh, homelessness become and, and people living in poverty who can't afford the homes moving into mobile homes, living on streets in East of Palo Alto. Maybe you talk a little bit about the NIMBY-YIMBY debate and how this gets solved. Is this an, an intractable s s situation? And how does one as an investor working on startups even begin to think about the NIMBY, YIMBY, homeless, you know, issue? Yeah, I mean, this starts to get into one of the sectors of the, the GovTech area that we invest in, which is governance. Um, and the counter movement to NIMBYism is YIMBYism appropriately. Yes. Uh, yes, in my backyard. And uh, right now, the recourse that uh, more more progressive uh, housing advocates are taking are legal mm. uh, and and forcing the hand of local government to to, to um, act on increasing housing supply. Um, and How's that working out? Is it even it, working? I mean, it's targetedly working. Huh. You know, there, I, I can't cite the specific example, but there, there have been some specific examples of that working. I think Sonia, uh, she's running for yeah uh, office, and and she's led some successful campaigns where they um, literally sue a city for yeah. not allowing housing to go up, right? And because they can filibuster in a community, and a lot of the local representatives are people who've lived in the community for a long time, so you get this really abhorrent. Yimbyism, right? That occurs, but this software software could be a potential solution to this. And true, people tracking and having data on it, yeah. which we don't even have data on. Well, so that's the funny thing, right? So you're having a debate about how quickly are we adding housing, right? What's the number? Nobody knows. No one knows, <laughs> and it's <laughs> obscurified by design in some cases. I yeah. believe. I don't mean to be a cynic, but I no, do think people are obscurifying. But we've we've asked people to really. I mean, it, it seems like Yimby versus Nimby is essentially if I view my home as an asset, of course I don't want to create more supply, right? But that's a very specific focus. If I view my home in the context of a community, I have right. a totally different view. I want the bike lanes. I want more activity. Yeah. So to, I, I feel like there's just, right now we've seen two parallel views. There's like a asset focused view of the world yeah. and then the value coming from, you know, d to some extent more public spaces, more people. Mm. Um, but I don't, yeah, there's definitely some policy that seems to be working, I guess. Yeah, yeah I mean, and to be clear, we haven't taken, I don't think we've taken, we, as much as we have a significant amount of housing focused investments, I don't think we've, we've finished our work there. Obviously it's really early on the, on the investments we've made, but there's a lot of opportunity still. I mean, we've, we've made investments in making construction safer. Our, our investment in Skycatch was along, the, along those yeah, explain lines. Explain that one. Um, you know, drones have a lot of potential use cases. Skycatch was very specifically um, making construction um, and increasing the efficiency of construction part of their use case. Uh, we invested in Architizer, which is helping architects find better products that go into buildings. Um, we invested in um, Social Construct. Ben Ha took over the YC New Cities project and spun that into an actual um, for-profit effort huh. to, uh, to rethink how housing development happens, how cities are built. Um, and then now out of the Urban X Accelerator, we're invested in a company that's helping actually bring ground level, real time truth to what's happening on a construction site. So we've so far focused very heavily on um, either making supply more efficient, getting more supply or rethinking demand in the co-living situation. Yeah. Um, and But there's, yeah, there's a lot of the civic tech 
political and um, and and data side of this that that still needs to happen. We we had office hours yesterday at at AngelList offices, and one of the founders we were able to meet with is specifically working on bringing transparency to the number of housing units actually being built in a city. Yeah, see, this is where it gets interesting. Is once the data comes out, and you start to see that some towns somewhere along the Caltrains that shall remain nameless, Palo Alto, um, and uh, are saying, hey, we don't want an apartment building here. And it's like, well, let's be reasonable. You have a Caltrain station. You are all a bunch of Facebook, Palantir, and Google employees living in Palo Alto and Atherton, and you don't want to make any more housing. Where are your kids going to live when, you know, they're gonna, your kids are not going to be able to live near you? Right, and this is like one of the arguments. Like your kids are not going to be able to have an apartment near you. What are you going to do? And these rich people who have benefited from the Bay Area are literally stopping the creation of apartments that their employees themselves would live in, at their own companies that have created their wealth. It's a level of a sinisterness that it it, it really is. I think completely unfair the way some people look at this. You need you need to have some housing options here, and what's happened in East Palo Alto is abhorrent. We have Facebook people buying up the apartments or moving there or whatever. This And then people who are poor there are living in uh, old RVs, families, kids. Yeah. And, and this is the most affluent area in the world. We're growing faster than most cities in the world and we have a bigger tax basis and we can't build new housing. Yeah, and I mean, it goes Crazy. beyond, it, it, it really, housing is the core of the challenge. You know, the balance of supply uh, is just skewed towards high income. There's just nothing left for middle income and absolutely nothing for low income. Um, and another way we've we, we've thought about and tried to approach helping uh, um, make this um, dynamic better is in um, right now, if you're wealthy, you pay a lot of taxes and you assume that the local government's gonna solve and help the, those in need, but but maybe you're a little more aware and you realize that you have to also do more to help mm. your neighbor in need. So one of our earliest investments, and our, actually I think our first investment w- that we were on the same cap table with you was Hand Up, which, yes. was, which was an effort. I think, Sean, you could speak more to how we... Um, how did we meet which just got sold, to, Hand yeah. Up, yeah. I'm trying to think how we met, but but I think the the appeal was, you know, local government is doing certain things. But there's a fair amount of evidence that sort of local businesses and consumers, to some extent, want to, to act directly mm. and have some control, you know, about you know allocating more time and money into some things. And so the initial uh, thesis, I think, with with Rose and the Hand Up team was, could you build an organization that actually just is more effective mm. as a private institution than? local government efforts at getting people out of poverty getting people off the street and moving right. from homeless to having a home to being out of poverty right and they built some great software to do it but it didn't work out they sold it but mm, that was a tough one for me I really yeah. wanted to see them make it yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I think what's difficult about that is you know you sort of I think that you, you it's very easy to get stuck in the I'm trying to do social good mm. and so people don't look at you as okay you know this is it's a large problem um, there's a lot of people who want to solve this. You could go around to most cities in the U.S. You could find institutional backers yeah. who who want to, and and I think they got they got close. I think when they when they sort of so shifted close. to B two B, there was clearly they you know they they'd figured out an alternative. But I think also like socially, we not I don't know if we're ready to acknowledge that we're building basically shadow government institutions. Yeah, right. We're building things like business improvement districts, which is basically. Shorthand for saying, right, it's shorthand for saying the governance process we have is not working. Let's take some money here and allocate it into whatever, security, cleaning, yeah. you know, upgrading of streets. And, and it seems reasonable that the people who live in the community could, you know, take responsibility for it. And I do think it's also one of these things with benefit corporations. I, I feel like when a company calls itself a benefit corporation, there's a group of investors who say, oh, nonprofit. No, it's yeah. a new class yeah. of benefit corporation. Yeah. And I remember having this debate on my other podcast this week in Startups with Rose about, hey, what is this benefit corporation? And I made the investment because I wanted to sort of get into it, but I've actually now advised people, please don't call yourself a benefit corporation. Yeah. Interesting. Because I've seen how people view it. Yeah. Right. Not every investor is progressive enough or enlightened enough or 
Look, Who knows? We, but it, it feels like a scarlet letter to me that when you put the B corporation on it, people say, oh, I'm not going to get a return. Look, at a, at a fund level, we had the same problem, hmm. right? If we go and p- tell people we're trying to reduce emissions, like, yeah. oh, good, do you want to talk to my foundation? I'm like, no, actually, <laughs> we think we can get you know really great returns. We should yeah. be talking to an investment manager. So, yeah, no, I mean, your pitch is like Blade Runner. Like, cities are going to become huge, fifth element, like – this is where people are going to live. This is where commerce is going to occur. Watch the fifth element. Watch Blade Runner. These story, you know, buildings are going to be hundreds of stories, and there's going to be a large density of people who need services and products, and right. it, it's it's going to be a gold rush in a way. But one of the things I like about what you're doing is none of us know as investors exactly what will work. Right. So if you want to take on something as complex as housing – you're going to have to take three or four swings of bats. And I, and I do think Definitely. once you're in the game, if you look at homelessness as an issue, you know, the problem, the problem of homelessness is embedded in the name. You don't have a home. If there was a greater supply of homes and they were at lower prices, yep. of course there would be some people who choose the life of living on the street. But we have a group of and, – and there were people who chose it to be vagabonds or hobos or as a lifestyle choice. But there's a large group of people who would rather not have this be what happened to them. A large group are out there because they can't afford a home. If a home was available for $500, they would be in it. But there are no $500. And if you just think about how backwards legislation is in cities, we have a lot of cities that have fought against micro apartments or have laws on the books against a minimum size apartment. Well, if we put 10,000 units in San Francisco that were 200 square feet, you know, dorm room like stuff, and they were super cheap. You know, you might have inf- you might have people choosing that who just want to save the money, or maybe they want to catch up and pay down their debt. Right. It could be a bridge to get out of poverty, but there is no way to get out, and, and except living on the street, which then is a road to nowhere. Yeah, how are you going to get a job if you if you can't if you don't have a, a residence? You can't get mail. Yeah, I mean, it's infuriating I, to me. I'm sorry. One of the other interesting, that, yeah. well, one of the other interesting things I, I think on on affordability is going to be, uh, you know, so if you look ahead at autonomous vehicles and you think about the cost ah. of moving around, the it, it you may the window may close on San Francisco's opportunity to build mm. those apartments. The, you know, Oakland may land up building them, right? Or the South Bay may build them, and then the cost of getting in and out of San Francisco may drop. Right? right, and you have more competitive ways of getting here, and I don't have to drive. I don't have to own a car. Um, yeah, yeah, that's going to be kind of interesting. I mean, if you think about it, there were I, I read that there were a number of bus lines in either San Francisco or other cities that, when they took the cost of maintaining the bus line, people were paying two dollars to get on the bus. But the actual cost of running that bus line divided by the number of people made each ride cost fifteen dollars. Hmm. So in other words, the person paying $2, the city was losing $13 on that ride, but they felt they needed to have that bus route. Then you have something like Lyft Line or Uber Pool show up right. at $4.50. Right. Well, maybe the city should just charge $2 for a Lyft Line and then pay Uber or Lyft. I obviously have a, a horse in the race, but it would still save them $10, which they're doing. Get, right. There's some places you don't need a bus line. You just right. need affordable, subsidized perhaps – um, Uber pool like services, Lyft line like services. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, yeah, I mean, these things are interesting when you sort of push the economics, you know, even like by a, a factor of 10. And then the yep. question is, well, okay, so you've been protecting supply, you know, for all these years, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden your competitors are going to emerge an hour away. Right. Simply because the cost of moving back and forth and the, is going to drop. Right. And some people are just not going to make the trip. I think it's one of the things that's benefited Brooklyn now I see in some of the startups is people are picking the startup they're going to work in yep. because they're in Brooklyn and they just don't want to go to Manhattan. Right. So now you're living local, working local, eating local. I mean, the whole thing starts to to sort of uh, collect onto itself. Um, what do you think the role of mayors are going forward? Because mm-hmm. – here in San Francisco, it feels like we have a pretty high level of incompetence. I don't mean to disparage anybody, but this city seems incredibly horribly run compared to the other two cities I've lived in, Los Angeles and New York. What are the roles of mayors in these cities in terms of if the technology is going to just solve the problem? Or are, are mayors just ceremonial positions? Or how do you look at the sort of 
the, the, the government organizations that you uh, are going to interface with, do they have any power? Do they have any ability to affect this change? Or is it just going to be bottom up? I mean, there's some interesting, there's really interesting work. So I think Bloomberg um, and Aspen Foundation have been trying to help build out policy mm. around autonomous vehicles to sort of save Aspen some Institute, maybe? Aspen Institute, uh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. I mean, um, and the goal is to say, well, you've got all this private money on one side that wants to bring, I mean, it's, it's incredible when you look at sort of the level of investment yeah. in AVs. What are you going to do? Well, you should be prepared to ask for very specific things, not just does the bus need a driver, but things like how does this change healthcare? Mm. What part of the healthcare system could actually go to people right. instead of trying to get them all to periodically miss their appointments? You know, yeah, if you're going to do a pediatric checkup, that could be done in a mobile unit in the parking lot of a mall. Right. Or they even have mobile dentists now going right. out to communities so you don't have to travel all the so way. So the medical device, I mean, all, all, everything's coming towards you. Yeah. All the things that you need on to demand. put on demand. Yeah. Um, same thing with education, right. right? Why are you sort of super constrained by, you know, where you live and the value of houses and the quality of the schools based yeah. on the tax base? Easier to move people around. So it's... It, I'm not sure that we're going to see sort of seismic change mm. in the short term, but it's definitely, you can see the, the sort of policy system getting to work on, okay, we want this, but, um, but yeah, there's some really complicated things. I mean, if, if, if you look at, again, like in mobility, if you land up with large privately owned fleets, mm. now your mayor is negotiating not with the public, but with like a handful yeah, Uber and Lyft, they're basically negotiating right. with those. And, yeah, I think one of the interesting things, I'm curious uh, as to what you think, Stonely, is I, th I think in cities, people should not be able to park on the streets. I think that we have this crazy system where people feel entitled to park on the street. And I grew up in Brooklyn. We, you know, People felt it was their right. Manhattan, for a while, people felt it was their right to park on the street in front of their apartment, that those were their spots. But in a, in a modern world... The idea that you leave a, a big, you know, whatever couple of that, you know, couple of ton vehicle box on the street, and everybody's got to navigate around your box of metal in the middle of the street, and you park it there for free and cause all this congestion makes no sense to me. Right. This I, San Francisco would be so much more livable if nobody was allowed to park on the street, with the exception of very residential neighborhoods. But this idea that people are parking because then everybody double parks. And Ubers and Lyfts are so much more efficient. We should just give them the curbs to drop people off. And why do people need to have cars? If you can't park a car in a garage, you should not have one is my my, my belief. I don't know. Am I crazy or wrong? Is it elitist? Or well, what do you think? Would you get rid of all these parking spots? That might be my first act as mayor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's tough because it's one of those behavioral science things that we run into a lot in, in, our, in our area of investing. Mm. And... What do you mean by behavioral sciences? Well, I mean, it, behavior is, is irrational. Um, we, we teach a course at the University of Chicago Booth School. Um, so we, I think we're obligated to pay attention to uh, Richard Thaler's work um, about irrational behavior yeah. um, and, and working against self-interest. Self um, and parking is one of these. And parking is one of these, right? Okay. You're, you're making your overall um, lifestyle harder by having a car. Um, and, you know, but when you're behind the wheel, you really want there to be convenient parking, right? And so, you know, there's this, it, it's one of these triggers where uh, in aggregate, you're working against yourself, but it, at the moment, you're gonna make this, this really bad decision of sure. driving into the city and parking, trying to find parking on the street. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the the it, it goes back to even another dynamic where you know you assume adding lanes on the road will reduce congestion, but you add lanes and you just get more cars. Yeah, traffic inducement, right? They yeah. call it the induced traffic. Exactly. You just people are like, oh, more more lanes, therefore I can live further out and commute faster in or whatever it is, and it, right. it just leads to more of a disaster. The one I saw that was really interesting. One of the key problems in traffic is that people circle. Yeah. They circle and they circle looking like for a spot. Forty percent of traffic yeah. is they people circle. looking for parking. Is that what it is? Yeah. It's insane. It's an insane. <laughs> and so what they want to do now, and they're going to try it in San Francisco, I understand, is dynamic 
pricing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're going to make it instead of just it's two dollars an hour in Soma, flat rate. During the day, Monday through Friday, it's going to be $6 an hour or $4 an hour. Something that makes you go, oh, it's $4 an hour or it's $6 an hour. I'm going to be here for six hours. It's $36. I might as well put it in a $20 lot and get this thing out of here. Or right. this, I could I could have taken UberX for half that and I could have you know slept in the car, done email. Why? What am I doing here? This makes no sense. And yeah. that gets rid of – and you start having things flow in the right direction. This congestion pricing seems to have worked in London as well to keep people out of the center. Right. Yep. This plays, again, into the psychology of if, if you – you have to simultaneously make it more painful mm -hmm. uh, to, to, for people to keep acting against their interests. But you also have to give them alternate options. Right. Right. And so those options, uh, you know, are – by and large, going to come from innovators yeah. who are who are creating new options for people to choose. How do you balance or think about? I wonder, Airbnb and people renting their apartments. This has become an incredible source of income for people who couldn't afford housing. Therefore, they stay with their neighbor or their sibling, and they rent their house out five days a month. They make three hundred dollars a night. They make fifteen hundred, so now they can afford the three thousand dollar a month apartment or the four thousand dollar a month mortgage payment. But of course, they're could be upsetting their neighbors. What are your thoughts on how to balance that, Sean? I wonder. When you think about a city yeah. and the Airbnb, because Airbnb seems to be another company that is so amazing for cities, yep. for the people who really live there to be able to afford it, but it also is working against them again. Yeah, it's interesting. I feel like one of the things that's happening is Airbnb forces you to, or forces communities to talk about who belongs to the community, mm. or like who, who do I expect, when I bought my apartment, do I expect everyone else in the in this apartment building to own? Yeah. Am I okay if they're renters or the renters a different status? Mm. Um, so I think we're sort of sorting through some of those things. The a lot of class issues there. Yeah. Abs absolutely. Yeah. Right. Like if the person can't afford to pay their mortgage and they have to sleep at you know their family's home, yeah. like maybe they shouldn't be here. They should have cheaper. So there's a bunch of these interesting yeah. um, dynamics. I mean, I, it, it, it Airbnb's yeah. I mean, it's fascinating. The management, the the, the sort of service layer of, you know, that's basically coming into cities and sort of trying to rebalance, hmm. um, you know, not enough hotel rooms. So we'll, we'll figure out how yeah. to increase that. Um, public transit sort of breaks down. Like, I mean, Brooklyn is amazing. I don't think Brooklyn yeah. would be where it is if you didn't have sort no. of Uber and Lyft. It just... No, I, listen, it, trust me, I was, uh, when I lived in New York, trying to get home to Brooklyn was incredibly difficult. Like, literally, this was the game, the cab drivers, but they pull up, they have off-duty light on. Right. The off-duty light's on. They lower their window a crack <laughs> so you can't get your arm in there. And they say, where are you headed? You say, I'm going home. They say, where's home? I say, uh, 76th Street. They say, get in. I say, and 7th Avenue in Brooklyn. <laughs> they say, get out. <laughs> and I get in a fight with the guy. And I said, listen, you got to take me to Brooklyn. I got to get home. I'm going to write a letter. To and I'm literally, we get into this back and forth with them. I, I can't go to Brooklyn. I'm getting off duty. I was like, you're not getting off duty. It's it's 3 in the morning. I know. The shift changes at 1130 midnight. There's a midnight to, you know, 12 to 12. You rent the, And this is this would be the craziness. And now, you know, you know, you can get to Brooklyn, no problem. And it makes every place livable if you can have that. Um, what's the craziest pitch you each got? Think about it for a second. Because when you put out your shingle and say, I'm a city, you're going to get some crazy stuff coming out. Yeah. So give me the craziest pitch you've gotten, either like legitimate pitch or a crazy person at a bar just saying like, this is how I think cities are going to change. You must well, have gotten I, some wacky stuff. Don't say the name of the company, embarrass them. Right, well, I'm, I know I'm going to win this one. So Sean, okay. I'll, I'll let you go. First. No, oh, here God, we go. please. <laughs> well, I mean, there's no following teleportation. Oh, come on. Yeah. Yeah. You literally mine. had somebody teleport. Yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. How? <laughs> it, obviously, was this an in-person pitch? This was, yes. This, it started off as an email and a tweet and became an in-person. I'm a physics buff. And I, and I, and you know, and also in our business, you're going to run into things that are crazy and you don't want to be the guy that said no to the people who invented teleportation. So you want to, at, sure you want to at <laughs> least give them audience. Wow. And, um, how did we wow. diligence that? 
There's, there's, there's no. How did you tell the teleportation? You yeah. tell the person, meet me in my office in three, yeah, two, two, one, one yeah. boom, manifest yourself. <laughs> and he, he didn't show up, so basically, no funding. Uh, I'd like a drink from Hawaii. Yeah, yeah seriously. bring me a mai tai. Yeah, I would like a donut from Los Angeles now. No, I mean it's it's you know we are at an interesting intersection uh, or point in history where some some of the more interesting parts of what we've learned about physics. 50, 60 years ago are really just showing up. Like physics breakthroughs got us to where we are with the computer age and the and the internet. But now we're getting into you know quant- actual quantum teleportation is happening. It's helping us create security protocols. Yeah. Um. Uh, but we're talking about things at the atomic, the quantum scale. Yeah. Whereas you know you can use some of the jargon to then spin a narrative around how we're only a few hops away from um, macro scale quantum teleportation um, and, and, and enough to have an entertaining conversation as Fantastic. it turns out. Um, enough for me to, to diligence it by sending as much as I could to my quantum physics friends um, and, and thank them for not unfriending me, right. um, but, but definitely not enough to convince me that they were really right. onto the, the real deal. I will match your teleportation yeah. and I will raise you an AI therapist literally was pitched, I won't say the name of the company, but an AI therapist. You open your phone, you tell the AI how you feel, the AI does therapy, that sounds like a lot of liability. Exactly, my, yeah. my first response was, who, 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 pro- oh, it's me. who programs this? It's like some great therapist, Freud, I don't know who, I mean, this is, therapy's pretty situational, isn't it? Like, what if the therapist is like, you know what? I'm sorry, Stonely, you seem very sad. Maybe you should end it all. Maybe there is no solution to your problems. Maybe getting out of bed in the morning is a mistake. Maybe you that- need to visit the Golden Gate Bridge. I mean, I don't mean to be dark here, but like putting AI in charge of people's mental health. It, I'm sitting there in the meeting and I just said to the person, is this a hidden camera show? I said to them, I said, because this pitch is so out there. We, we're just beating people at chess and poker and AI. To do therapy and try to work with people's emotions, this should be done by other humans, not a machine. And he's like, well, if a machine can beat somebody at chess or poker. I mean, there is a seemingly reasonable rationale that AI at some point could be a better therapist because you might open up more to it. Sure. Well, I mean, this this really reminds me of a, a graffiti, a piece of wall art that I ran into in Mission um, which which stuck in my head, um, and it read, "My problem is wor- or my solution is worse than the problem." And <laughs> my solution is much yeah. worse than the problem. Yeah. I love that. And I mean, you know, you get entrepreneurs, and um, you know, we really do owe a lot to the entrepreneurial spirit. And you get innovators, and obviously, you get some fraudsters. Yeah, but small percentage of of genuine folks who are interested in solving problems in new ways, but uh, sometimes you do end up with um, secondary, tertiary consequences yeah. and side effects that that yep. you may not have anticipated. And you know, well, all, Facebook. Yeah, I right. mean, we're yeah. sitting here with Facebook, and we literally elected a president. Yeah. Who is insane? I mean, I don't mean to take a political side here. I'm sorry if you voted for Trump, but this person's clearly deranged, and could be causing a nuclear war. It made the stock market go up, but I mean. We could have had Facebook swing the election. We don't know exactly, but in certain, we may find out that the Russians stole voter rolls and t- geo-targeted people. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a yeah. level of in- Facebook. If you if you looked back, you'd probably say, you know what, Facebook net net. We might look back on it and say, you know what, we should not have created that. Right. Predicting the future is very hard. Like g- making money is only one small part of what we end up accomplishing if we're lucky. And um, and even when you're lucky and you win, you may look back at your life and say, I kind of fucked up. Yeah. Because I, I funded this thing that's right. ruined the planet. Welcome back to Angel the Podcast, <laughs> where you can invest in a company that destroys humanity. <laughs> My guests today are working on nuclear fission to solve the energy crisis, but it may also rip a hole in time-space fabric yeah. and destroy <laughs> the universe, but we could have free electricity, so it's it sounds like it's worth trying. Right. I mean, fusion, all this crazy stuff. Like, I mean, 
What what could happen? What's the worst that could happen? We I don't need know. a name for it. Universe collapses on itself? It is a dilemma. We need a name for it because we do need to invest in the things that target solving really interesting, really hard problems. Yeah. Um, and, th you know, the way we think about uh, investing is, you know, you're, you're going to be wrong most of the time and you won't get the return you're looking for. But hopefully you're right enough that it offsets. This is the classic venture yeah. formula. And when you're trying to solve specific problem sets like climate and cities, we also acknowledge that we're going to be wrong some of the t most of the time. Yeah. Um, and hopefully we're right. And when we're right, we're right in a big way. And, you know, I try to get myself to sleep by also hoping that we don't have consequences of yeah. being right that end up unintended being bad. Unintended consequences. Yeah, unintended are consequences. I mean, it really, for everybody who thinks they're doing the right thing, you know, anonymity on Twitter had a purpose. People, you know, in Egypt who were, you know, using it to communicate, you know, the revolution really did get a benefit from it. And now we have anonymous Russian bots and people being tortured and cyberbullying. I mean, and the bot problem on Twitter is an existential threat to the existence of Twitter at this point. I mean, it's like, I almost feel like not using it anymore because when you try to say something intelligent or have an in, any kind of important debate, result my at least my feed results in like 50 bots now who have 10 followers and some you know alexander hamilton or a, a frog as the avatar pepe or something and they're and they're all debating stuff i mean i'm like is this the same mentally ill person who pitched me on teleportation i don't, I, I don't know how to do it you're, you're you're one of the hardest working people in the in the oh. early stage investing space i don't know how you have time to fight bots I don't Honestly, know. I mean, I yeah. feel like a superhero at times. I agree with you, Stoneley. I feel yeah. like sometimes Captain America. Here I am helping startups, and then I'm going on and fighting the bots for to, to help America. No, I have to get off of Twitter. I'm going to resign from Twitter at some point. All right, listen. I could talk to you guys for, for hours and days, but we've already done an hour, and, then, and that's it. We're, we're done. Urban.us. Go ahead and visit urban.us. Uh, quality, quality investors trying to do the right thing for humanity. Sean, thanks for coming on the program. Great to meet you. Thank you. Uh, and Stonely, great to see you. Thank you. Likewise. I mean, Stonely, also, I just have to say, you know, I, I really, uh, I'm a very judgmental person, as you know, and I judge people very harshly. And uh, I always ask my founders, what was the meeting like? How did it go? And over and over again, people say, that guy's Stoney, he's so smart, he gave me plenty of time, he was really considered in his feedback, the follow-up was great. So I thank you on behalf of my portfolio companies and the companies I invest in for being uh, so diligent and, and so generous with your time and, and your efforts. I, I, you, it's very easy in this game to get high on your own supply and think because you're writing the checks, but you take an hour or two with these companies, and then after you invest, I know you take a lot of extra effort and I take pride in that so I appreciate it well thank you Jason we've invested in I think Ecomo three, yeah blockable a few now and we're about to okay. uh, invest in yet another one we won't announce yeah, we it yet yeah, we'll, 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 we're, we're having a lot of and it's not Kush it's not Kush I'm wearing my Kush now and I realized <laughs> I'm wearing Kush Marketplace jacket which is a cannabis marketplace that I invested in and I realized my meeting after the next meeting I'm going to see Cafe X and then I'm going on a nursery school tour <laughs> Not a not a child nursery. No, like no, I'm going to for my twins are gonna to go to nursery school. Okay. And I, I'm not going to a nursery for cannabis. <laughs> and I'm wearing a cannabis jacket. And I just said to my wife, I I gotta stop home. She's like, Well meet me there. I'm like, I, I kinda gotta stop home and get a jacket. Because this jacket it's a, it's gonna be a coin toss if this jacket is gonna create a stir at the open house for the Montessori nursery school we're going to. All right. Thanks again to everybody <laughs> tuning in. Thanks so much for supporting us, NetSuite from Oracle. Thank you so much for supporting us. I really do appreciate it. And uh, Emmy Award winning producer Jackie, thank you. And Jake, Master Jake, thank you for your service. You did a great job working here for two and a half years, and I do appreciate it. Good luck in your future endeavors. Stick or, st keep us up to date on what you're working on. Okay. We'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.